Welcome everyone to the ForensicWeek.com show. This is episode 36 and I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ, Inc. and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Tonight, undercover narcotics operations with guest retired Maryland State Trooper Lieutenant David Reichenbach. ForensicWeek.com is a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists, investigators, security and legal professionals who find, collect, examine, and adjudicate forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live on your desktop every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows recorded and broadcast live using Google+. Forensic IQ Update Report is another feature of the show, reporting on current issues, high-interest criminal cases, events and training opportunities that are important in the forensic community that are presented live on the show and posted on the ForensicIQInc.com blog by my student interns from the University of Maryland. Student producers and interns with us this evening are from the George Washington University Department of Forensic Sciences, Laura Pachuki, our producer. Stevenson University's Derek Wong, co-producer. University of Maryland Criminal Justice major student interns, Alexandra Mitzo, better known as Alex, Emily McGowan, and Kip Zenowitz. Before I introduce our guest, and begin this evening's discussion, let's hear from our producer, Lara, uh, to tell you a little bit about how you can contact us and ask questions. Lara? All right. So any questions, comments, or future ideas about the Forensic Week show can be directed towards ForensicWeek at gmail.com. If you're watching tonight's show live and you have any questions for our guest, you can leave a comment on YouTube and we will bring that up tonight and ask Dave right now on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the subscribe button below on YouTube. Um, you can watch all archived shows on uh, ForensicWeek.com 24-7. You can also find us on Facebook by searching the ForensicWeek.com show. You can also like and share our Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Tonight's topic for discussion, undercover narcotics operation. We will learn about the life of an undercover narcotics officer, how they are selected for this dangerous assignment, how they are trained, and of course, the two objectives that ForensicWeek.com always wants to satisfy for its viewers. What role does forensics, forensics play in undercover narcotics operations? And how do you become an undercover narcotics officer in the federal, state, and local agencies? We have with us this evening our guest, Maryland State Police Lieutenant Retired David Rockenbaugh, who, when he retired, was Operations Commander of the Criminal Intelligence Division, who played a pivotal role in the Washington, D.C. area sniper case, that multi-jurisdictional investigation that occurred in 2002. Those of you who are um, regular viewers of the show, you remember episode 28 when Dave uh, was a guest on that evening. Dave spent 23 years with the Maryland State Police in 14 of those years uh, working narcotics and that's why we have him on the show this evening. Uh, also, he is a uh, wiretap expert and uh, he is presently, uh, as a civilian, uh, working for the United States uh, Capitol Police. Dave, thank you so much for coming again. I appreciate it. Uh, although I would normally say you're a busy guy, but right now you're uh, you're being furloughed, so uh, you're uh, you're busy around the house. I bet, right? Yeah, the uh, working on the honeydew list. <laughs> You know, Dave, um, I get a lot of students who are criminal justice majors who are interested in law enforcement, and so many of them say, hey, look it, uh, I don't really want to be a cop, uh, a beat cop. I, I want to be an investigator. I want to do undercover work. I want to do narcotics. Uh, and uh, I have to explain to them that it takes a lot of time and effort and experience and training to get to that point. Uh, why don't you just start off a little bit by uh, telling us a little bit about how your career as a trooper ended up working undercover in narcotics. 
Well, my my introduction into narcotics sort of came rather unexpected. I was a very young trooper, less than six months out of the academy, working the road. How old were uh, you at the t How old were you at the time? Well, at, at that time, I was at, at the Frederick Barrack, and uh, narcotics division at that time consisted of about three guys. This is before the uh, quote war on drugs started in the early 80s. Uh, there was a investigation come up at a local biker bar in Frederick that was a lot of uh, cocaine was coming out of this particular bar. They knew it. They couldn't get anybody in there. They needed a fresh face. They pulled me off the road. I I, I had to go home and get a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> and they, they basically, since we were Fort Detrick, they told me I was uh, a military guy looking to buy some coke, and would I go in this this bar and see what I could do? Had absolutely no clue what the heck I was doing. No training. I was, I, I was working with a very experienced uh, narcotics officer, probably one of the best undercover guys certainly Maryland ever saw. The guy's a, a state police legend, uh, retired uh, Detective Sergeant Warren Reinecker. Uh, he gave me uh, two hundred dollars and uh, said, "Go in the bar and see what you can do." <laughs> and I said, "Yes, sir." And he said, "The first thing is to stop calling me sir and get your butt out of the car and go in there." So they dumped me out. I went in the bar, drank a couple of beers, bought a hundred dollars worth of cocaine off of some guy. I come out, got the cocaine, pretty proud of myself. Got back in the car and the. Detective Sergeant asked me who I bought it from. I said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> and that was, the, uh, that was the start of my narcotics career. <laughs> is that a true story? That is an absolute true story. And, and they still kept you in narcotics there. Then, huh? Well, actually, actually, what it turned out, what they were doing, and what I later found out is, is – they were looking for potential narcs, and my name had come up. I was a pretty aggressive trooper. I, I was making one arrest on the road after another criminal arrest, and it was basically a test. Here's a hundred bucks. We know there's drugs in that bar. If if I didn't come out with drugs, I would have been back on the road writing tickets the next day. But mm -hmm. since I came out with drugs. Uh, the detective sergeant said, you're the kind of guy we're looking for. Are you interested? I said, well, yeah, that was that was sort of fun. He said, well, we'll teach you the rest. And, and I went from there. And basically what they're looking for is, number one, you, you got to be a class A personality. you got to be aggressive. You have to be very keen to detail. And also, if not as important as all those things, you have to have the ability to communicate. Uh, what my wife likes to say is, I'm full of BS, so you got to have a, a good bit of that in you, but you also have to have the ability to write. That's extremely important. And you roll all that in together because narcotics investigations, believe it or not, it's not what you see on TV. They're extremely detailed. Uh, because you're you're in a sit undercover situation, you you've got to observe everything, because it might be just a little wink or a nod from one person to another that leads you to the next level. Now and let, me, let me ask you, Dave. All right, so did you did you do start working full time as uh, in narcotics after that incident in the bar? Or, or was well, it, it took about three weeks, and the next thing I know, I'm transferred into. Uh, in, into narcotics, I was the uh, I was the only permanent narcotics officer in in Frederick. There was only one other state narcotics officer west of me, uh, Corporal Chester Miller, who is is deceased. Um, loved that guy like like a brother, uh, and we worked the entire western part of the state for several years. Okay, now. You know, you, you just retired recent, not, not too long ago. D uh, did that change? Okay, so you you didn't you didn't seek the job out. They they sought you out. 
correct? That's that's correct. Okay. Is that has that changed any? Uh, really, really no. Because when I got um, sent back into intelligence after September 11th, uh, the state police had fallen off on intelligence, and we were no longer in the undercover intelligence business. And obviously, September 11th changed that for every every law enforcement agency in the country. Mm -hmm. It was extremely important that you get boots on the ground. And, and by that, I mean you got to have guys on the street. you got to have people infiltrating various groups, seeing what they're up to. So as, as a commander, and since I had so much experience, I was tasked with going out and finding undercover troopers. And the qualities that I just told you were the kind of folks that I looked for. So I went out and recruited the troops. I knew who the best troops were, and basically I talked to them, I gauged their interests, I tested them a little bit, and if they passed my test, uh, we got them transferred in. Okay, and let me, let, I, I want to started. tell us what you looked at when you saw a trooper and said, hey, that's a guy that uh, we, we might want to use as an investigator, our, our narcotics officer. Because the people, our viewers who are going into law enforcement or are in it already now, you know, they, uh, you know, what behavior should they be exhibiting so that they, they get noticed? The very first thing that I looked for is I reviewed reports. I reviewed their investigative reports, uh, and I didn't necessarily look for their big cases. I looked at their everyday run-of-the-mill what I called pain in the neck when somebody beats in your mailbox with a uh, baseball bat type report. Are they sloughing it off or do they do they write like they care? Do they have a passion to find out who smashed up that lady's mailbox and how bad did they want to catch them? And you pick that up in the reports and, and, and it's detail, detail, detail. I'm glad and you that's said the that. first thing I look for. You know, uh, University of Maryland, not last uh, fall, but the fall before, uh, started requiring certain uh, courses for all students to take, uh, you know, critical thinking uh, uh, and communication courses. All freshmen uh, coming in now have to take those courses. And, you know, I can't st uh, stress that enough to my students, and I'm glad to hear you say it because, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you want your child to do something, uh, go tell someone else to tell them, and they'll believe they'll listen to to you. Right. So uh, I appreciate that. Let's um, again, because I'm wa I always watch the clock, and this thing goes, and I have so many questions. I want to go back to the cover story. I uh, when you were undercover, uh, were you using your own name? Were you using a different name? A, a cover? How did you create your cover? One of the things that you want to do is 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 you want to keep it simple because when you're under a stressful situation, it has to come natural. So you don't want to create some stupid TV name. I, I just went by Dave. Uh, number one, I never gave anybody my last name because drug dealers don't give anybody else their last name. You have to act like you're on the street. So I was very elusive, but I was also very kept it very, very simple. And I worked undercover as, as a biker, as a nurse, as a business guy, as Joe the plumber. Uh, it all depended on who the target was and what we were going after. And what what I did primarily was I wasn't interested in the uh, the street dealer. I used the street dealer to get to the next level. The the, the perfect undercover investigation doesn't take down, especially in narcotics, doesn't take down one or two guys or people. You want to take down the entire organization from the point of entry to the kid that's buying it on the street. So you're always working up and, and you kept your cover very, very simple so that you didn't fall into your own trap. What about your family and friends? Uh, what did you say to them about what you were doing? Because you might have bumped into uh, one of them in the middle of uh, an operation or something. 
Well, all the other uh, law enforcement folks that knew me, that's the first thing I would tell them. If you ever see me out somewhere, unless I talk to you, don't talk to me. Uh, hmm. and, and that's that's pretty well known within within law enforcement. You see an undercover somewhere, you don't pay any attention to them unless they, they contact you. And I'm still that way to this day. I, I see some guys that I know are working undercover, and I don't say a word to them unless they come up and talk to me. Now, I'm, I've am i long since gone, but th those are habits that uh, I, I've never forgotten. As far as family is concerned, uh, my wife loved it. I, I had hair down to the middle of my back. That's when I could still grow hair. Uh, that's when I met my wife. Uh, <laughs> she was it, it and I and I will tell you it takes a very special family to put up with uh, a, an officer that's working undercover because your hours are, are are very very strange they're not normal hours but when I came home I left the job on my desk or in my car um, when I got out of my my car I was done for the day and I put it all behind me. And I see that I've seen a lot of young troopers make mistakes taken at home. And before you know it, it affects their family life. And well, you know, and I never did that. You know, the problem today is technology is cause it's hard not to take it home with you now because because of iPhones and you know met, you know, everybody expects that if you've got a telephone with you, then you should be uh, able to be contacted any time, and it, it's really difficult. So I guess you, you literally have to shut the phone off. Yeah, yeah, you do. And and I tell you, I, I encouraged uh, my troops that worked for me. You know, I know how to get a hold of you, and I'm not going to call you unless it is an absolute necessity. And if you see my number coming up, answer it because something's up. And you have to you have to be able to compartmentalize. That's one of the, the skills that you have to have. Let me ask you about the difficulty with uh, counties and state and federal agencies not always cooperating or working together. They're all doing their own things. What was your experience in rep when you when you were working a case and trying to develop a case? Was there a good relationship, and, and how did that work? with uh, other agencies? I can tell you, in, in, in my career, the relationships were outstanding because there's sort of a certain understanding with, with undercover operations. Uh, you depend on each other. Uh, I can give an example. I started out with a, a little marijuana trash run in Frederick that turned into one of the largest cocaine cases Frederick County had ever had up until that time. I'm, I'm sure many have beaten that case. In fact, but but I wound up uh, traveling to Miami and working the case with Miami Metro Dade, and it was very very smooth. It was very smooth transition. I was uh, federally deputized, so I could cross state lines. I worked openly with with DEA uh, and U.S. Customs. It really wasn't a problem at the investigative level. The problems really come in at the the upper echelon because then it's turf. Mm -hmm. And when when you're you're an investigator, you don't have time for that. Um it's bad enough fighting the bad guys and, and keeping yourself in one piece. Let let alone having to worry about ticking somebody off because they're in a different uniform. But I, I never had a problem. I, you know, I worked in Miami. I worked in California. I worked in Pennsylvania. I can't tell you how many times. West Virginia, Virginia, District of Columbia. Never once in my 14-year career did I have a jurisdictional problem. Great. How about with the feds? The feds were great because the feds had money. Um, <laughs> and the state didn't. Uh, so we needed the feds. But the feds needed us because those guys couldn't couldn't find an original case to save their butt. Now I, I will tell you, there'll be DEA agents that would come on here and argue with me uh, wholeheartedly. But if you look at the at the guts of every federal case, 
it started at the local level somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes the federal prosecution was was difficult because you'd work a case, and it was a major case for your area, but it didn't rise to the level that the feds were looking for in the federal realm, and, and that's where it became difficult, and that's where our local prosecutor many times had to go to battle with the federal prosecutor because a pound of cocaine in Frederick is huge. A pound of cocaine to the federal government, that's nothing because they deal with shiploads. Mm -hmm. So if you can see, that's where the issues came so, in. So the objectives are basically different between the yes. local, you know, and as long as everybody understands that, you know, I'm I'm glad to hear because I I'm, I know you well enough to know that uh, you say it the way it is. I, I'm glad to hear that there was a good relationship because that that doesn't happen all the time and um, and it needs to. And when it doesn't happen, uh, cases are, are lost and people are hurt. So that that that's good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, my students, uh, again, uh, I, as I told you before the show starts, I got plenty of questions to ask Dave. And Dave has plenty of things to say, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, please don't be afraid. And I see uh, Kip raising his hand right there. Go ahead, Kip. Uh, you mentioned that you had to play a bunch of different characters in your journeys. And um, which was the hardest of them all to try to act as? Probably the most difficult one was uh, we were working, uh, uh, it was a big cocaine case. In, in the Pimlico area of Baltimore and it was primarily Jamaicans and they're extremely difficult to infiltrate because they're, they're a very close community uh, and I, I don't mean for anybody to take offense with what I'm about to say but I'm gonna say it the Jamaican community were very protective of the homosexual community for whatever reason it's a cultural thing so I, I went down there and, and I, uh, confidential informants are also key, which is something we need to get to. But I had an informant introduce me to a very, very low level, street level uh, coke dealer, uh, Jamaican, and I was posing as a homosexual nurse. And I had to, certainly I, I got the background from my wife who's who's been in, working in the ER forever, so I knew enough medical jargon to be dangerous, uh, but certainly I'm nowhere near being a nurse level. But that was very, very difficult for me to, 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 to play, but it worked like a champ. Uh, I was very, very quickly able to infiltrate that organization, and I went right up the line, and, and basically I bought my way up the line, wound up writing six wiretaps, and at the end of uh, 12 months, we arrested, I think it was 63 or 68 Jamaicans for all felony. Uh, three of them went federal and got serious, serious time. One uh, we, we brought back from England to face trial in, in Baltimore Federal Court. But that was, that was a tough role to play because the Jamaicans at that time, they don't play. Uh, I I bought kilo level of cocaine with with guns to my forehead. Um, I was shown several extremely attractive naked women to see that if I would react, because they were testing to see if I was who I said I was. So as you can imagine, okay, that that was not easy. Yes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll leave it go at that. Yeah, but, would you? <laughs> but uh, it, it it worked out well, and it was a very interesting case. And it also showed you how dangerous it was. They and how how I had them hook, line, and sinker. I went down there to buy a kilo of cocaine, and and I'm carrying uh, at that time it, it it was like forty five or fifty thousand dollars of federal money, and I was being obviously surveillance by our surveillance team. Everything that we did was extremely well planned out. Uh, I, I do think that they were more concerned about losing the money than me. They could always find another trooper, but <laughs> not necessarily the money. 
But I was uh, in the middle of the deal. This this uh, Jamaican came in, and I'd seen him one time. He came in and said, uh, "Who are you selling to, man?" And and I said, "Well, I got my my customers I've had for a long time. Why?" He says, "Because the cops are watching you." And he proceeded to to point out and describe four out of our five surveillance vehicles. Is that right? And. I knew I had to do some fast talking, and I said, well, I don't know. He said, uh, listen, brother, he says, we'll get you out of here. He said, uh, but you're going to have to be more careful when you come down the next time. So they actually snuck me out their back door, <laughs> down some forsaken alley, into a van. I thought I was, you know, who knows where I was going to go. They got me out of the Pimlico area. And, of course, the surveillance team did hear some of this going on over the wire, mm -hmm. so they knew not to follow. But the point being is, is I had them so hook, line, and sinker that they never once thought I was the man. They That's thought great. the man might have been been uh, trailing me. That's good. Hey, uh, Derek, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, Dave, you're out there collecting evidence. Um, are you ever asked to testify in court? Oh uh, yes, uh, I I testified all the time. I was I was a uh, considered an expert witness in narcotics investigations, search and seizure, and I can't remember. I think it was either 19 or 20 counties, uh, also in the state of Virginia, West Virginia, District of Columbia. Uh, testifying was a regular thing, and and where those cases are won or lost and this also gets you into the forensic part of this, is, is in the suppression hearings. That's, that's when the evidence is discussed, and it's extremely important the way you handle your evidence, what you do with it. Uh, we tracked a lot of, we even went to the next step based on a lot of the forensics. Uh, we looked at, uh, if, if I was handed a package of, of cocaine, we, we constantly tore that package apart to test for fingerprints on the inside of bags, on the inside of wrappers, whatever it might be. Of course, we did the chemical test to not only verify that it was cocaine, but at that time, you knew how far up the chain you were based on the, on the quality of, of the dope. So the higher quality of the dope, you knew that you were getting to the source. On, on television, they uh, the way they test to see if it's really cocaine is they they op break open the bag and, and they put it to the and to their mouth, which is a little absurd. Or or is it that absurd? Uh, is there a certain uh, taste to cocaine that gives you some indication it's what you think it is? Well, quite honestly, the best test is is you you get a little bit between finger and and. Uh, Thumb, and it's been a long time, Tom, but I still remember this. You, you get a little between your finger and your thumb, and you rub it. And if it turns oily, it's the good stuff. If it's just sort of chalky and you don't have any oil sensation on your hands, you're buying uh, probably chalk. Uh, now, you said so that's you, one you, test. you used field, uh, field tests to, uh, to, uh, as, a, as a presumptive test for the, this sometimes? Yeah, we use field tests, but certainly not in the undercover situation. Um, we were taught to simulate testing. They, they just never knew what finger it was I was sticking in my mouth. But one of the things that we never ever did was you never ever consume any of it because you've passed that line. And once you pass that line, you never come back from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that is, that, that, those, those field tests are pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not going to give you a percentage of the quality, whether it's marijuana, you're looking at, at the percentage of the THC, whether it's the cocaine, the quality of the cocaine, the heroin, but the, the higher the percentage, the further up the, ch the food chain you are. And the way the state police do investigations, again, as I told you, we're not after the street dealer, we're after the entire organization. That's, that's the mark of a perfect, well-run narcotics investigation. Okay, great. Derek, um, uh, Derek, did you have a follow-up question? Otherwise, I'm going to go to Alex. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, uh, when you're testifying in court, uh, do you have to protect your identity when you're there, too? Uh, no, that's, that's virtually impossible. By the time you testify in court, 
the case is over. Uh, the arrests have been made. They're going to find out who you are. My big concern was is is protecting our our sources of information. And typically, there are several ways to do that. But what we would do, and I'm I don't want to give away any secrets here. No. But we would have an informant that would introduce, say, me to a bad guy. I would buy drugs for a while, and then I'm going to introduce another undercover up the chain. So we may have three different undercovers working the same case. So by the time it comes to court, they're so confused, they don't know who introduced who. And believe it or not, that works. Have, uh, so have you testified and then later on went back undercover again? Oh, absolutely. Did it all the time. Okay, um, Alex, go ahead. Uh, that kind of answered my question. I was just going to ask if um, you were ever identified as an undercover and people wouldn't sell to you just because of word of mouth they heard, so watch out for Dave or something. Well, like, I, I, became, be I became by? pretty well, I'm sorry, I became pretty well known in Frederick. Um, however, I can tell you, and this is, this is an absolute true story, I, I won't tell you the bad guy's name because he's he's so dumb I don't want to embarrass him if he's out of prison. Uh, but I bought, we were just trying to do some street level level buys because we had a lot of drive-by shootings that were starting to happen in Frederick. And, you know, the, the mayor and the chief were, were after us, so we went in and took out some local drug dealers. And, and, and the one guy, they got time, believe it or not, in Frederick County at that time, if, if you sold cocaine at all, you were going to jail. And I bought, I think, an eight ball of cocaine off of this this guy for a couple of hundred bucks, and it was one or two percent cocaine. It was junk, but he got three years. About four years later, I'm going downtown, and I see this guy walking down the street, and I just did it for the heck of it. I was by myself. I pulled over. He walked up to the window, and I said, "Hey, man, remember me?" He looked at me and he said, yeah, I remember you. I said, hey, you holding? He said, uh, did I sell to you before? I said, yeah, you sold to me before. So he pulled another eight ball out of his pocket, sold me another eight ball, and this time he got ten years. <laughs> so you, you, you just have to be yourself, but you, you, you got to be a little bit smooth. you got to have plenty of game as they like to say on the street but the big thing is, is don't be afraid to talk to people you know television portrays these folks as being smarter than they really are sometimes I think you know when you watch these show you know uh, they, they always have the upper hand for a while you know but uh, I you know I always tell my students when you're doing an investigation if something s seems to be pretty obvious don't ignore the obvious because sometimes it's hitting you in the face, you know. And uh, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is. And okay. it's uh, and and I can tell you, they're 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 most of these guys. As I used to tell my my troops all the time, don't think you're that smart, boys, because we only catch the dumb ones. <laughs> I want to remind everybody that uh, you are listening to FrederickWeek.com, and uh, our show this evening's topic is Undercover Narcotics Operations, and our, our guest uh, is uh, Dave Rockenbar, from, uh, retired from the Maryland State Police. Uh, Dave, I'm going to give you a little break uh, for a second so uh, I can uh, have our students uh, do some reporting from the uh, Forensic IQ update. I'm going to start with uh, Alex. Alex, uh, tell us what you've got uh, in the blog uh, this week. All right. Um, the first blog post that I did was about free forensic training because last week you had mentioned that you wanted to get some more of those posts up there so people could see what we have to offer. Um, it's sponsored by RTI International Forensic Science Education website, and all of the training they have on there is free. You can go to their website and explore all the different options. They offer forensic anthropology training, fingerprint training, toxicology, DNA profiling, drug testing, you name it. They have tons of different kinds of training on there. And I posted the link on the website on that blog post so you can just follow that to it. And um, the second article that I did was looking at a new methodology to determine the height of a blood spatter source. 
and um, a teacher named Fred Giddes and a student named Chris Varney at Washington State University um, figured out a way to determine the height of the blood spatter source, which in the past um, they were never able to do that because the math and like the formula that they would use would give them, I think, three or four different possible heights for um, where that blood spatter source, source could be. So um, they looked at it again and figured out that using simple trigonometry and several blood spatter droplets instead of just one can actually give you the actual height. And they did some experiments in their lab to make sure that it worked, and it did work out. And so now we can determine the height. Well, you know, I, I read that today uh, uh, when I uh, published it on the blog, and I'm saying I wonder how important that is. Uh, Laura has one of her faculty at George Washington University that hopefully she is a, a blood spatter expert. We hope to have her soon. Uh, and maybe we can ask her how significant that is. Is it that important? Give me some some instances when knowing the height of a blood uh, droplet uh, is going to be that important. So we'll find out how uh, good that is. Great. Okay. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. Emily, how about you? Sure. So my first blog post is in wake of the 50th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's assassination. Um, Dunks University, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's Cyril H. Wake Institute of Forensic Science and Law is hosting a symposium to re-examine the evidence of the assassination. The goal of this symposium is to educate students and professionals about the details of the assassination and why this event is so important to continue to study. It's going to be held October 17th through the 19th and you can check out the blog for the agenda. Yeah, doc, Dr. Wecht is a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, and he was he was one of the medical examiners who was involved in the autopsy of, of Dr. Ken, uh, Dr. Uh, President Kennedy. Um, so it'll be kind of interesting. I'm I'm sure people are going to run to that thing because they're going to think they're going to have something new. Uh, I don't think there's anything new to be uh, uh, talked about, but for those who uh, uh, are interested in that, that kind of stuff. That might be a, a good thing uh, to, uh, to do. Okay, what else? So my second post was about uh, a new DNA analyzer. So Dr. Frederick Zenhazern, who is a bioscience professor at the University of Arizona, he's created a portable DNA analysis device that's about the size of a printer. And they can take it directly to the crime scene and process the DNA in about in a few hours. And that'll help speed up uh, the judicial process and making an arrest. Well, I, I, that's nice. Not that I think that anybody needs to be processing DNA uh, at the crime scene, but uh, if it does, if, if the process makes it faster, uh, and, uh, that that would be good. Very good. Um, Kip, thank you, thank you, Emily. All right. So good evening. By, by the way, if all my uh, viewers are wondering where Emily and uh, Kip are, they're at the uh, University of Maryland College Park Crime Lab, my laboratory, and uh, um, so uh, they decided they must have met at the same time rather than be in their own places. So good to have them together. They, you kind of look together, good together, nice and clear, etc. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Kip. All right. So good evening, everybody. Um, my first article this week is a case from 1991 in which a body was found off of the uh, Henry Hudson Parkway in New York City. Um, and the cases have now had a breakthrough because uh, no one was able to find a parent of the body previously. There was no uh, no identification with it. And uh, luckily, due to a recent DNA find in 2011, they have found a mother of the body, and uh, the mother is now cooperating with the police to help out the investigation of the murder. Was she why did they have her DNA? Was she arrested for something? Um, I'm I actually am not sure. Um, I can look further into that. Um, I but I don't know at this time. Okay. All right. What else you got? My second article. Uh, the case is not solved. However, police have linked DNA from from a murder of an old rape case from ten years ago uh, to a, mur a recent murder in California. Uh, the murder had some evidence from the rape that had happened in 2003 on the same scene. And uh, the DNA from Sylvia Flores and uh, 
came back as a match um, from the given evidence that was found at the scene. Uh, now that person is, when when found, that person is going to go away for a very long time. Uh, I got to say, any, any of the viewers who are in a position of authority in in their organization, uh, you know, DNA. The only thing we, DNA is at a point right now is as long as we can get the DNA samples in in a timely fashion, we can make these cases. Uh, uh, much faster than ever before. It's all about getting, collecting the DNA, getting it processed, and getting it in, in the CODIS, uh, the federal CODIS database system. And uh, I'll tell you, it's gonna, it's gonna, it already has changed the way we conduct investigations, uh, but it, now it's going to certainly make it much easier than ever before. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate that. Uh, let's get uh, back to our guest. Uh, Dave, uh, you talked a little bit about I mean, one of the cases you were talking about. You were talking about you got six wiretaps, and I know that you're an expert in wiretaps. Tell us what you what you mean by that. When do you do that, and um, what's the process for getting a wiretap uh, in a case that you're working undercover? A, a wiretap investigation is probably the single most complex police investigation that you're going to have, and it ranks right up there to a, a murder case that's a whodunit, uh, where you don't have a clue starting out who may have committed the crime. Uh, basically, to, to, to get a court-ordered, court-authorized wiretap, you have to basically do what is exhaust, what they call exhaustion. In other words, you have to use every investigative technique and have failed with that te technique before you're going to get authorization to listen to anybody's phone conversations, whether they're cell phones, landlines, uh, even now some of the social media is now covered under, under wiretap rules. And it's been a while since I've, I've looked at that, but I know a lot of that is now covered under those statutes. Is the target of a wiretap a person, a phone number, or a location? Usually the target of a wiretap is probably an unknown person. In, in the case of narcotics, it's the source. Who is the source of the drugs, in our case, coming into the state of Maryland? That's where we want to get to. And in other words, we, we've used informants to try to infiltrate this organization. We may have succeeded to some success, others not, like the Jamaican case I just described. Okay, I was able to get in on a street level. I was able to work my way. I was able to buy my way past the street level. In other words, I'm now ordering half ounces and ounces of cocaine that this street dealer can't sell me. So he's got to take me to his guy. Maybe his guy sells ounces. So now I'm buying ounces. So I want now I want quarter pounds. And this guy, hey, I can't get you quarter pounds, but I've got to take you to my guy. So you work your way up until you can't get any further where the man won't meet you. Uh, you've you've done trap and trace as far as you've, you've done a forensic analysis on their phone records, you've done surveillance until you can't do surveillance anymore, uh, you've done traditional trash runs, you've done everything that you can possibly do, and the only way you're going to get the bad guy is to go up online. You have to put that in, in a, a, the form of a court order, uh, and in my day, and I'm sure it's, it may have streamlined some under the Patriot Act, but in my day, an average wiretap order was about between 350 and 400 written pages of every detail that you did in that case, which takes me back to what I said at the very beginning. Say that, say that, Dave, say yeah. that again. How many pages? Between 350 to 400. For one wiretap. For one wiretap. Uh, for one I, don't, I don't see that on television. I don't see those three, four hundred pages on television. No. You're you're talking 
anywhere you're you're talking probably a thousand to fifteen hundred investigative hours to get to that point. Then you write it, you present it to a circuit court judge, and there's only a few of them around in the state that'll even entertain a wiretap investigation. They're going to review it, and they're most likely they're going to come back and say, nope, there's not enough. So then you start at square one, you do it all over again until you satisfy that judge. Judge, I I think Tom Morello is 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 the dealer. I think he's the one that's getting the drugs in from Miami. The evidence is pointing that way. I can't prove it. The only thing that is left to do is is I know he's communicating on his phone because we've done the trap and trace. We, we've shown where the you know, same numbers are popping up here and there. We've tried to identify those numbers. Most of the time, they're, they're, they're burn phones, and you have no idea who they are anyway. You just mentioned, which, tra you just mentioned two terms, trap and, uh, trap and, uh, trap and trace. That's trap what we used trace. to call it. It might be a different term now. And what do you mean but by basically that? Basically, what you're doing is we used to call it a pen register. You're going up on somebody's line. And it's recording on a piece of paper every phone number that that person calls or every incoming call. And you have to have cooperation with the phone company to do that. And you have to have a court order to even get that far. Uh, you're then looking at that and you're conducting an analysis. You're looking at every number and you're running down every number. Who it belongs to, who they are, when they're calling, is there a pattern. You're trying to pick out who the dealer is. One of the things that, that, I, that we love to do is I would call the guy up and say, hey, I'm coming down Wednesday. I, I, I want to I, I buy a quarter pound of Coke. You're immediately watching that trap and trace because you know the guy you called doesn't have that kind of weight. Mm -hmm. So who does he call? Because they want your money. That, that's the one thing that makes, makes this easier to do. They want your money. They love green. So who's he call? Okay, that might be a clue right there. You know, I hung up from him two minutes later. He calls a, a, another a number. So you're looking at that number, who it is. That's probably the number you're going to wind up going up on when you get your court authorization. Uh, once you're up, again, that's a highly intensive labor effort because it's 24-7, 365. There are certain calls you cannot listen to. You have to minimize. If the guy's talking to his wife or husband, you can't listen to that call. If he's talking to his doctor, you can't listen to that call. If he's talking to his minister, you can't listen to that call. What if his doctor is the supplier? Well, you at the beginning of the wiretap, you're allowed to listen. You're allowed to listen to that call long enough to know to try to determine based on experience and, and what the case is whether it's a drug call or not. Uh, my case, they talked about carburetors. Um, hey, I want a full carburetor. That was a kilo of cocaine. I want a half a carburetor. Well, any moron knows you don't go to the store and buy half a carburetor. You're either buying a whole carburetor <laughs> or none at all. But to them, that was their little... You know, they never used the the, 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 the the big words. You never heard Coke or pot over the phone. It was, hey, I'd like a full pair of pants. I'd like a half a pair of pants. It was always, there was always some little little uh, phrase they used, and you learned that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you only listened to calls that you knew what we were called were pertinent. Then those calls have to be absolutely transcribed. And depending on the judge, I would sometimes have to report to the judge's chambers every morning at 8 o'clock and go over all the calls from the day before and tell that judge what, what I thought was pertinent and what, I, what, I was, what wasn't. And at some point, that judge would say, well, you've got enough, or this isn't getting you anywhere. I'm turning you off, and, and you're done. So, again, it's very labor-intensive, not only on, on law enforcement, but it's also labor intensive, and, and you need a dedicated judge that's willing to work with you, and, and also certainly the state's attorney has to approve and review all of this.
I wanted to ask you about the state's attorney or the prosecutor, depending on uh, where you're here, uh, where the viewers uh, listening from. Uh, are they involved in writing some of these documents for you, or, or does the law enforcement officer have to do it all? No, I, I I wrote every one of them, uh, with certainly with their input. But after you've done it for a while, you know what to write. You know the law. Uh, you, you you before long you're writing like an attorney. And and I can tell you, I I did I think 13 or 14 wiretaps in my career. I never lost one at suppression, not one. Um, so you 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 have to work hand in hand with the prosecutor, and the judge. Uh, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to something that happened last week. And Laura, if you have uh, that URL for that story uh, that happened in New York, where I, I'm not sure if he was an undercover narcotics officer, but he was undercover with a uh, a gang, uh, a motorcycle gang in New York. That uh, uh, that was a situation with the uh, the Asian family and uh, you know running the guy over, the guy getting run over. Bottom line is, um, in the news recently, uh, in the last couple of days, they said that the under uh, that one of the members of the gang was an undercover police officer uh, who was engaging in the criminal act, and basically he was he was breaking the window of the family's vehicle in the back, etc. And he's been charged criminally. So uh, when you're undercover and get with a group of people who are committing the crime that's why you're with them where is the line at what point uh, do you not engage in the activity to keep your cover um, and um, and what do you do how do you do that do you just walk away or do you blow your cover and leave uh, well, what's your experience I, I can tell you that that's a very, very fine line that, that you're forced to walk. Uh, there are several types of undercover. There, there's what we call plain clothes, which are guys that are just out there in plain clothes walking around looking for stuff. That's, that's not undercover. That's plain clothes. Then there's undercover where you're actually going in and you're participating in a crime. Because if you think about it, when I'm buying drugs... If, if I'm not law enforcement, I'm breaking the law. So in essence, you are breaking the law when you're bar buying drugs off of a drug deal. So you have certainly immunity to that because you have to buy drugs to get to the next level. When it comes to violence, that's a line you cannot cross. I, I don't care what the situation is, you can't cross it. Now, to work bikers... You have to work more of a deep undercover, and, and that's that's getting into a very very dangerous situation. And you've got to have a special kind of person to do that, because then they have no home life. You're putting them in deep. You're putting them in an apartment. They're living the part. They're playing the part. And I don't know, I don't know enough about that case to say what this this person was doing. But if he was even working deep undercover, if he steps across the line and is committing violence, he stepped across the line and and he's he's now a criminal. He's no longer law enforcement. You know, if if that happens, the best thing he could have done, if he is truly working undercover, is become the best witness yeah. that that there is. And at some point, if he's working deep undercover, that's it. They've crossed the line. It's time to pull the plug. It's time to make your arrest, make the best case you got, and move on. Yeah. But if he stepped across the line and he actually assaulted, you know, by, by punching out that window, he committed assault. Right. Whether he actually touched the driver or not, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the story, but he crossed the line. There, there's, there's no excuse, no reason for it. Okay, um, what I'd like to do, because uh, I see we have about five minutes left, is a little bit about um, playing mentor to some of our younger folks who are ge just getting into law enforcement or are attempting to. Um, what's your suggestions to them in reference to uh, uh, 
going into, I, I mean, and you already talked about it a couple of things already, but uh, what kind of skills, what, how do they prepare themselves to have a career in, in, this, in this area of law enforcement? Well, number one, you need to know who you are. You, you need to know, and, and when I say that, you need to know that there's a clear line and you will never, ever cross it. Because to make a case by crossing the line, you're not making the case. You're, you're, you're just as bad as the dirt ball you're trying to, uh, to arrest. So you got to know who you are first. You got to be very self-confident. You got to be confident in yourself, confident in your ability. Uh, you got to be able to think on your feet, never quit. And number one, at the end of the day, I'm going home. Maybe the bad guy isn't, but I'm going home. Can you tell me the difference between confidence and cocky? Well. There, there are a lot of cowboys out here that are undercover, and they don't last long. Uh, confidence is you get that case, and it comes in as a tip. Hey, there's, there's this guy dealing some dope to some kids at an elementary school. Confidence is I'm going to track that guy. I'm going to find a way to get him. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, but I'm going to stay on this case until I get him because I know I can. Cocky is, is let's go to the playground and, and just jack the guy up and hassle him. Maybe you get lucky and he's got a little bit of dope on him. You might get a misdemeanor case. You get your name in the paper. That's cocky. Confidence is, I got you, I'm going to get you, and the worst person you, if you're a drug dealer, the worst person you wanted in the state of Maryland after you was me. <laughs> Maybe that sounds a little cocky, but it's, it's, it's not meant to be. It was confidence, because if there's a way, I'm going to get you. Dave, I want to thank you very much. Uh, really, uh, this has been a great show, uh, uh, and I always feel like we've just scratched the surface uh, when we uh, an hour ago so quickly. Uh, but before I say goodbye to you, I just want to uh, talk about next week's show, and I'm going to bring it to uh, Derek. Uh, Derek, could you tell us about our guest next week and what we're going to be talking about? Yeah. Uh, so next week uh, we have Dr. Thomas Coogan, who's the uh, chair of Stevenson University's forensics program. Um, so we'll be discussing Stevenson University's MOOC program, which is also known as a massive open online course, um, which is a free 10-week online course that covers topics in forensic science, uh, cyber forensics, and forensic studies. So the course just opened last week and ends on December 8th. So if you want to learn more about it, tune into our show next week. Absolutely. Uh, those of you who are listening out there, um, maybe you've already got a degree or you want to go into this field and you want to learn more. Uh, this is a great program. Um, I don't understand it completely and that's why we have Dr. Coogan coming in next week. Uh, you really, it, it, it's, it's, edu it's a way of, uh, of learning content um, quite different than, uh, than we have in, in the past. It's not in a classroom. Uh, it's in your computer, but it's uh, a great program. We're going to learn all about it. So thanks to Derek, who, uh, who scheduled that uh, guest uh, next week. Uh, I know Dr. Coogan. I've known him for a long time. I'm glad to have him on there. So thank you for that, and that'll be next Thursday. The following Thursday, October 24th, we have Dr. Quanda Stevenson, no relationship to Stevenson University, but she's from Athens State University in Alabama. She's, uh, her specialty is the study of bullying, and October is the month of anti-bullying, so she is going to talk to us about that and talk to us about uh, the crime, uh, uh, the victim, um, and the perpetrator. So uh, that'll be a good show. The following week, October 31st, is Halloween. Uh, we're not going to have shows on Halloween, and we're not going to have shows on Thanksgiving either, which is... Uh, um, uh, coming up at the end of November. November 7th, we have Dr. Ken Beck from the Uni uh, University of Maryland Department of uh, Behavioral and Community Health. 
uh, talking about alcohol misuse and impaired driving and the process uh, that law enforcement goes through for identifying and collecting evidence. November 14th, Jim uh, Christie, uh, a well-known federal computer forensics expert who just retired and, and who's uh, going to be on the show. November 21st, again, thanks to Greg, we have Mr. Timothy Austin Darp, who is a fingerprint uh, examiner. Um, Dave may know Tim. I don't know. He uh, he's a retired fingerprint uh, examiner from Maryland State Police, and now the chief of security at Stevenson University. Dave, did you know Tim by any chance? Yes, I did. I I think he made a case or two for me over the years. Well, he's going to be on the show on November twenty first. Uh, we have a, we have a number of other guests that are just not we haven't got the uh, the exact dates yet, but uh, all you have to do is be paying attention. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Dave Rockenbar for so for being here and talking about his experience and knowledge uh, of of uh, undercover of a narcotic operations. Um, ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation with the Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to the Hangout10.com website and see the schedule of other shows like this one available to you to learn and be entertained. Meanwhile, viewers, tune in and keep watching ForensicWeek.com live every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or remember, you can view any of the shows past shows that are archived on YouTube at your convenience right here on ForensicWeek.com. Dave, thank you very much. To my students and producers and everybody, thank you. Great show. We hope the content presented in this show as well as the previous uh, shows has opened your mind and curiosity to the wonders of forensics, security, counterintelligence, and criminal justice. Meanwhile, ladies and gentlemen, see you next time and thank you for watching.